This video is not an investigation of the authenticity of black Hebrew Israelites or an attack on Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. We are not here to question anyone's faith. The creator of this universe has witnessed enough carnage on this earth with each group professing to be representing his directives. We aim to establish that Africans, which essentially means black people, established the concept of monotheism and knew this before the advent of these religions. The African was not a heathen before the arrival of Arabs or Europeans. The Star of David, a symbol widely recognized in Judaism, has roots in history. It can be found engraved on the side of an ancient Egyptian temple at Elephantine, Abu or Yebu, located near the border with what used to be Sudan. This design featuring two pyramids, one reaching upwards towards the spiritual realm and the other grounded towards the earth, represents a powerful concept. It symbolizes the connection between the spiritual and physical worlds, echoing the core African philosophical principle of Ma'at, which states that what exists above mirrors what is below. Interestingly, the Star of David, also known as the Shield of David or Magan David in Hebrew, became widely recognized as a symbol of Judaism in the modern era, particularly in the 19th century. Before its adoption as a Jewish symbol, the hexagram was used in various cultures, including Kemet, or what Western scholars call Egypt. Its association with Jewish communities became more pronounced during the Middle Ages, but in the 19th century, it started to be universally recognized as a symbol of Judaism. This coincided with the rise of Jewish nationalism and the Zionist movement, which sought to establish a Jewish homeland. The Zionist movement was promoted by several key figures, but one of the most influential was Theodor Herzl. Herzl, a Jewish Austro-Hungarian journalist, playwright, and political activist, is often considered the father of modern political Zionism. Herzl's 1896 pamphlet, Der Judenstaat, the Jewish state, proposed the establishment of a separate nation-state for Jews as a solution to the growing wave of anti-Semitism against the Jewish diaspora. He organized the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland, in 1897, which laid the groundwork for the future establishment of the State of Israel. The Star of David's association with Jewish communities became more pronounced in the late medieval period, especially in the Jewish mysticism of the Kabbalah, where it was seen as a symbol of divine protection and the relationship between the divine and the mortal. The Zionist movement, aiming to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine, adopted the Star of David as a central symbol, helping to cement its association with Jewish peoplehood and nationalism. This culminated in the star's inclusion on the flag of the State of Israel in 1948, by which point it had become a definitive symbol of Judaism and Jewish identity worldwide. Judaism, known as the first of the three major monotheistic religions, alongside Christianity and Islam, is noted to be less focused on conversion than its counterparts. We will begin by stating our concluding facts. Egyptians believed in one true deity, Imana. They circumcised their male offspring and referred to their writing system as the words of the creator of the universe. Who were the original Semites and where did the term come from? Were Africans really idol worshippers before the establishment of Abrahamic religions? A revealed religion is one believed to come directly from a divine source, rather than being based on human observation of nature and the universe, like natural or animistic religions often termed as pagan. Judaism is considered the first of such monotheistic and revealed religions, claiming to originate from the moment the Creator first communicated directly with humans. This foundational event sets Judaism apart as the faith of a people chosen by the Creator to spread His message to the world embodying the idea of being the chosen people. This concept of divine selection is central to Judaism and unfolds in three key stages. The initial meeting and covenant between Abraham and God, symbolized by circumcision. The delivery of divine laws, Torah, to Abraham's descendants through Moses, including commandments and regulations. God's ongoing guidance and intervention in the lives of his chosen people through direct actions or messages delivered by prophets and angels. Judaism emphasizes divine involvement in human history. 
inviting scrutiny of these beliefs through historical and scientific research. However, the concept of monotheism, as well as practices like circumcision, predate Abraham and Judaism with roots in African traditions. According to Sheikh Anta Diop in Nation Negra et Culture, such ideas were present in Egypt and Sudan long before the emergence of Judaism, suggesting that monotheism was not a novel concept introduced by Abraham. Imana, or Amen, recognized as the singular deity of Africa, is depicted in various forms, including male, as seen in the Temple of Hatshepsut, and both feminine and masculine representations. This depiction is found in the Louvre Museum. The evidence suggests a singular, encompassing deity, rather than a pantheon of gods and goddesses. There's a perspective suggesting that the Western and Semitic portrayal of ancient Egypt as polytheistic was in part an effort to align with the narrative of Abrahamic religions. Additionally, evidence of circumcision, a practice later adopted into Abrahamic traditions, dates back to ancient Egypt, well before the arrival of Semitic peoples. This is illustrated in the tomb of Ankhmahor, a high official during the reign of Pharaoh Teti around 2345 to 2333 BCE, indicating that such rituals were practiced in Egypt several centuries before what will later be known as the Semitic entry into the region. The word hieroglyph originates from Greek, translating to holy writing or sacred engraving. However, the people who created these symbols referred to them as medu nature, meaning the words of God or God's speech. This highlights an understanding of divine communication long before the advent of Judaism and its holy scriptures. In African tradition, God, known as Imana or Amen, who remains unseen and does not speak directly to humans, communicates through the natural world and the cosmos. It's believed that deciphering God's messages requires a scientific approach, which is why hieroglyphs incorporate elements from nature. Before the story of Abraham and the founding of Judaism, the concept of a single, all-powerful God was already present. The depictions in the Pyramid of Kemet, some of the oldest religious writings in existence, support the idea that early civilizations had notions of divine laws and communication from a supreme single creator of the universe. Judaism emerged among Semitic peoples, a term we often hear but might not fully understand. Before diving deeper into the origins of Judaism, it's important to explore who the Semites were and how their cultural and historical context contributed to the development of this religion. The terms Semitic originate from Shem, a biblical patriarch thought to be the ancestor of the Semitic peoples, including Hebrews, Arabs, and related groups. These labels, developed by Western scholars, draw from biblical references to categorize peoples primarily from Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, tracing their mythical lineage back to Abraham. The initial Semitic groups emerged from the mixing of the Sumerians, dark-skinned pioneers and early settlers of Mesopotamia, and nomadic, warlike groups from northern Eurasia. So who were these established communities of dark-skinned people with deep African cultural roots? These groups included Persian archers, who traced their lineage back to the Elamites, credited as the earliest civilizers of Iran. This is a depiction of a Persian archer, as seen in the Louvre Museum. The Sumerians, also referred to as Zalmat Gagadu, or people of blackheads, acknowledge their distinct physical appearance and cultural contributions. The Canaanites Phoenicians. We have covered this group quite extensively in a recent video. See the video description. The ancient people of Kemet, popularly called Egyptians today, celebrated as true pioneers of civilization. This is a depiction of a typical Egyptian found in the tomb of Rameses, the third, authentic African name, Ramesu Hekayunu. This dates back to 1200 BC. This blend of cultures and peoples gave rise to the Akkadians, with Sargon of Akkad founding his empire around 2300 BC, a significant historical figure marking the so-called Semitic entry into recorded history. This period follows roughly 300 years after the construction of the Great Pyramids in Africa. Due to their nomadic lifestyle, these early Semitic peoples spread throughout the so-called Near East over time. Indeed, the so-called Fertile Crescent, 
a region stretching from Mesopotamia to Egypt across West Asia and Northeast Africa, became a central area for Semitic migrations and settlements. This area is rich in historical and biblical narratives, showcasing the influence of Semitic groups in ancient texts. The Bible tells a story of Abraham leaving his homeland in Chaldea, Mesopotamia, to journey to Canaan, a land not originally his that would eventually be inherited by his descendants. This narrative introduces the practice of nomadism among Semitic peoples as they move into new territories. However, from a scientific and historical perspective, it's clear that Semitic populations are not all direct descendants of a single ancestor named Abraham. As these groups spread out, they encountered a variety of influences and experienced different destinies, leading to the emergence of diverse Semitic populations with distinct identities and histories. These Semitic groups, from their earliest days, interacted with the civilizations of Sumer, Canaan, and Egypt, regions heavily influenced by African cultures. The Bible acknowledges these interactions, depicting waves of nomadic Semites settling in Canaan, where they encountered the original inhabitants, sedentary black Canaanites with close ties to Egypt, who had lived in the area for thousands of years before the Semitic migrations. Many Semitic nomads from Mesopotamia ultimately made their homes in Canaan, drawn by its relative prosperity and described biblically as the land flowing with milk and honey. Others continued on to Egypt, a major center of the African world in antiquity. The African world of the ancient Near East, particularly under Egyptian influence, interacted with these Semitic newcomers. Egyptian texts often referred to the various Semitic groups collectively as Asians, reflecting a broad category rather than specific ethnic or national identities. The term Asia, now used to refer to the continent, actually comes from an ancient Egyptian word that meant the East or Eastern to our ancestors. So when they referred to Semitic groups as Asians, they were simply indicating that these people originated from the Eastern regions. These Eastern groups or Asians were known by various names depending on the context, including the Amu, the Shasu, the Hekakasut, known in Greek as Hyksos, the Habaru. Long before Semitic groups arrived in Egypt, our ancestors were already aware of them. The Egyptians, in particular, were familiar with nomadic tribes known for their notoriety, as raiders, among other things, who roamed the ancient Near East in pursuit of loot. On occasions, Egypt would step in, especially in Canaan, to quell any raids or unrest these groups caused. In the tomb of Khnumhotep II, an authentic pharaonic fresco, dating back to around 1900 BCE, documents the first official entry of a group of about 40 Semites into Egypt, led by their chief. This artwork enables us to follow their presence in Egypt from this period. The fresco depicts these Semites, identifiable by their tanned skin, entering Egypt peacefully and officially for the first time, with the Egyptians engraved at the bottom. It illustrates the Semites coming to pay tribute to the Pharaoh, signifying their subjection to Egyptian authority. Two Egyptians, distinguished by their white loincloths, are shown documenting the tribute brought by the Semites. In this fresco of the Octatuch, created in the 11th century, is rooted in biblical stories. It illustrates a moment from the Bible where Abraham and his wife visit Egypt and encounter the Pharaoh, who is shown seated on his throne. Notably, this fresco, made many centuries ago, reflects a recognition of the African heritage of the ancient Egyptians. This suggests that the understanding of Egypt's African roots was widely acknowledged at the time the fresco was crafted, indicating a historical appreciation for the diverse origins of ancient civilizations. When Semitic groups first ventured into the regions inhabited by African peoples, such as the Canaanites and Egyptians, they were predominantly polytheistic. It was through interactions with these African communities that they were introduced to monotheism and its associated practices. An interesting account from the book of Genesis, chapter 14, verses 18 to 19, highlights this cultural exchange. It describes how Melchizedek, the king of Salem and a priest of the Most High God, welcomed Abram 
later known as Abraham, with bread and wine, blessing him in the name of God, the Lord of heaven and earth. This encounter is crucial because it shows that Melchizedek, a Canaanite king, was already a follower of monotheism before Abraham's arrival in Canaan, the land that would later become known as ancient Palestine. This implies that the African Canaanites, like their neighbors in the Nile Valley, practiced monotheism before the arrival of Abram, who is often considered the first monotheist in Semitic religious traditions. In essence, the Bible inadvertently reveals that monotheism was already established among the African peoples at the time Abram entered their lands. Furthermore, the passage where Melchizedek blesses Abram underscores that the very first monotheistic rituals Abram participated in, such as sharing meals of bread and wine, were African in origin. These rituals, long present in the Nile Valley civilizations like Egypt and Sudan, were part of the worship of Osiris and were shared with Abram by King Melchizedek, highlighting the African roots of some of the earliest monotheistic practices. The story of Abraham and other nomadic figures in the Bible, such as Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, highlights how Semitic peoples adopted monotheism and various cultural practices from African communities, specifically the Canaanites and Egyptians. These interactions are depicted in biblical narratives, showcasing how these early Semitic nomads integrated customs and religious rites from the advanced civilizations they encountered in Africa. This exchange of ideas and practices underscores the significant influence that African civilizations had on the development of Semitic cultures and religious beliefs. The term Hebrews in the Bible initially refers to a few individuals like Abraham and Jacob and their families rather than a distinct people. When these patriarchs and their groups arrived in Canaan or Egypt, they were not enslaved and the concept of a Hebrew people developed over time. Real historical events likely inspired the biblical narratives about the Hebrews, a people whose existence is primarily scriptural. The word Hebrew itself likely comes from Habir or Apir, terms found in ancient texts from Egypt and Canaan, used pejoratively to describe scattered nomadic Semitic groups. These terms did not originally refer to a distinct people or a language. The story of the Exodus, as told in the Bible, where the Hebrew people escape slavery in Egypt and journey to the Promised Land, lacks historical evidence. Cech Antajob, in his book, Nations Negre et Culture, provides insights that may explain the origins of this biblical narrative. Job suggests that Moses lived during the era of Pharaoh Akhenaten, around 1400 BCE, a time when Akhenaten attempted to revitalize Egypt's ancient monotheism. This religious reform aimed at creating a unified religion to support the political unity of Egypt's vast empire. Moses, influenced by these reforms, is portrayed as adopting monotheism passionately within his community. This context is set in the 18th dynasty, a period of immense Egyptian power and expansion under Pharaoh Tuthmose III. During this time, Egypt was a melting pot of people from its conquered territories who came for work to settle or to pay tribute. Jop places this transformative period specifically during Akhenaten's reign, suggesting that the biblical Exodus narrative might have been inspired by historical interactions and the significant religious reforms of that era. Akhenaten revolutionized Egyptian religious practices by discontinuing the worship of various manifestations of the Creator, called deities. These deities are Osiris, Isis, Hathor, and Anubis, which priests traditionally mediated. Instead, he established the monotheistic worship of the Aten, the sun disk, as the sole expression of the divine, allowing only himself to conduct its worship. Akhenaten's actions positioned him as a unique figure in history, akin to the first prophet centralizing religious power and practice around this singular deity. Egyptologists and other Western scholars with little to no understanding of African culture and religiosity have erroneously assumed these manifestations of Imana as separate gods. We will discuss the manifestations of the Creator later in this video. The biblical account of the Hebrews entering and settling in Palestine, described as the Promised Land, was marked by significant violence and brutality, echoing the actions of the Hyksos and Haberu, ancient groups known for their aggressive conquests. 
Scholars have drawn parallels between these groups and the Hebrews of the Bible, especially in their treatment of the Canaanites. According to biblical directives, the Canaanites were to be exterminated to claim their land and possessions for Israel, a narrative detailed in the book of Joshua. However, the actual conquest of Canaan by the Semitic populations might not have happened as swiftly or directly as the Bible suggests. Historical evidence, such as the Merneptah Stele from 1207 BCE, indicates that Egypt maintained control over Canaan well into the period following the 18th dynasty, contradicting the timeline of an immediate post-Exodus conquest. The Semites' integration into Canaanite society was a gradual process, involving cultural assimilation and the adoption of Canaanite languages, which later came to be recognized as Semitic. This slow blending and eventual autonomy led to the establishment of the political entities of Judah and Israel around 1000 BCE. These developments occurred in the context of regional shifts, including the decline of traditional powers like Egypt and the arrival of new groups such as the Sea Peoples, shaping a complex and evolving landscape in the ancient so-called Near East. The emergence of Judaism and its foundational texts can be seen as a response to political upheaval and the need to unify a people with a shared history, ideology, and laws. As the Assyrian and Babylonian empires overran the Canaanite region, previously protected by the declining Pharaonic Empire, the Semitic kingdoms of Israel and Judah were destroyed in 722 BC and 587 BC, respectively. This led to the dispersion of the Semites and the legend of the lost tribes of Israel. Upon their return to Canaan, these communities sought to reconstruct their nations and identity. The creation of Judaism as the religion for this nation, along with the drafting of holy scriptures, served as the foundation for rebuilding. The Hebrew Bible, or Tanakh, was crafted during this period, encapsulating the nation's history, laws, and religious beliefs. This project aimed to foster a sense of national pride and identity by introducing concepts such as the chosen people and people of God. Scholarship attributes much of the work on the Hebrew Bible to Ezra, a priestly scribe, who is credited with compiling these narratives and concepts. Despite the absence of historical evidence for many of the events described in the Bible, such as the slavery of Hebrews in Egypt or the 40-year desert wandering, these stories have played a crucial role in shaping the identity and religious beliefs of the Jewish nation. The Codex Amiatinus, an 8th century CE manuscript, features a fresco depicting Ezra engaged in the composition of the Hebrew Bible, marking a foundational moment in the formation of Judaism. In crafting Judaism and the Tanakh, the religious and cultural traditions of various regions where their forebears had lived and roamed were amalgamated. This synthesis included Mesopotamian influences incorporating Sumerian texts, traditions from Canaan, such as those found in the writings attributed to Sancho Nieton, Egyptian elements, notably the monotheistic worship of Aten, and teachings attributed to Osasef. These diverse sources were integrated with the Semitic people's own patriarchal and martial customs, which starkly contrasted with the more matriarchal and peaceful cultures of the regions they drew from, showcasing the multifaceted origins of Judaism. After returning from exile and beginning to rebuild their community, these people started identifying as Jews. Originally, the term Jew described someone from Judea, also known as Judah or Yehuda, a Canaanite region. The Canaanites were the area's first inhabitants, but it was the settlement of Semitic populations in Judea after the exile that led to them being called Jews. Their history, marked by nomadism and domination by various powers, fostered in them the concept of a messiah, a political and religious leader who would establish a powerful and self-sufficient nation free from domination. This aspiration for a grand national identity is echoed in the Bible through stories of majestic kingdoms led by figures like David and Solomon. However, in reality, Jewish states such as Judah and Israel remained small and vulnerable eventually fading under the control of successive empires like Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Despite the biblical vision of a sovereign promised land granted by God, the Jews had to coexist with numerous peoples and face continuous conquests over the centuries. This struggle is documented within the Hebrew Bible itself, through tales of wars and conflicts, 
including the famous story of David and Goliath. The grandeur of kingdoms like David's or Solomon's as depicted in the Bible contrasts with the historical reality, where the dream of a mighty Jewish nation was repeatedly hindered by external domination. These narratives of splendid Jewish reigns are largely legendary, embodying the hopes for a significant national future that the Bible sought to inspire. The interactions between Semitic nomads and the peoples of the African regions, such as the Canaanites and Egyptians, are well documented, including in the Bible through stories like Abraham and Hagar the Egyptian and Joseph's marriage to an Egyptian woman. Over centuries, these interactions led to a blending of cultures and to some extent, genetics. However, despite any changes in their physical appearance, these Semitic groups continued to identify with their Mesopotamian origins rather than adopting an African identity. Similarly, African communities recognized these Semites not as one of their own, but rather as people from Asia, highlighting the distinct cultural and geographical identities maintained despite their close interactions. Over time, the diverse physical characteristics of Semitic peoples, influenced by their interactions with Canaanites and Egyptians, began to change significantly due to invasions by lighter-skinned populations, such as the Sea Peoples, Philistines, and Greco-Romans. These groups arrived in the ancient Near East during periods when Canaanite and Egyptian civilizations were in decline. As a result of these invasions and the subsequent mixing of populations, the Semites gradually adopted lighter skin tones, a trait that is more commonly observed among their descendants today. The Jewish identity of the Ethiopian Jews, often referred to as Falashas, remains a topic of debate with various theories in play. Ethiopia itself has been at the center of discussions about its connections to Judaism, partly due to the legendary tale of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. While the Bible recounts a meeting between these figures, it doesn't detail a romantic relationship, a narrative that was later developed in the Ethiopian text, the Kebra Nagast, in the 14th century. Some scholars, like Professor Jean Charles Cuvi Gomez, suggest that the Ethiopian Jews might trace their lineage back to ancient Egyptians, who followed the monotheistic Aten cult under Pharaoh Akhenaten, whose religious reforms influenced early Judaism. This connection could account for the ritualistic similarities between Ethiopian Jews and other Jewish communities. Shlomo Sand proposes another perspective, viewing Ethiopian Jews as having converted to Judaism at some point in their history. Genetic studies support the idea that they are ethnically Ethiopian with no external origins, this discourse emphasizes the notion that while cultures and beliefs have been shared and adopted across different peoples and regions throughout history, the fundamental identity of African communities, including their monotheistic beliefs centered around the deity Imana, is rooted in the African continent itself. Africans should stomp out the erroneous Western belief that we were idol worshippers before the introduction of Abrahamic religions. Creation reflects the capabilities of the Creator, showcasing a vast diversity from plants and animals to humans, indicating the Creator's multifaceted potential. This diversity points to the Creator having various aspects or forms of existence and action. These various forms include roles as the master of the universe, the ultimate Creator, a parental figure, the sovereign of time and eternity, the embodiment of power, love, truth, and justice, among others. For example, the manifestation of divine love is likened to the maternal affection of Isis for her child. When embodying truth and order, the divine is referred to as Mat. The aspect of wisdom or knowledge is represented by Jehuti, Thoth. These manifestations, known as deities, are not separate gods but different aspects of the same divine essence. The Creator's androgynous nature, encompassing both male and female, explains why these divine aspects are depicted in both masculine, example, Osiris, Anubis, and feminine, example, Isis. Thus, when expressing concepts like love, light, truth, or judgment, our ancestors would invoke deities like Isis, Ra, Ma'at, and Osiris, respectively, as manifestations of the one divine principle, Amun, meaning hidden. This approach underscores the belief that the divine in its enormity and mystery 
cannot be fully comprehended or directly worshipped in its entirety. Therefore, rather than direct worship, our ancestors chose to honor the divine through its known aspects and manifestations, dedicating temples and rituals to these forms. This multiplicity of worship does not signify many gods, but a single divine principle with varied expressions, ultimately embodying the profound, unknowable essence of Amun. Until the lions have their own historians, the tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. 